Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, after ICE detains a leading immigrant rights activist, where do we stand? Recent mayoral candidate Robert Ganji talks about police reform and the falling crime rate, and an artist on her Brick House exhibition, an abstract animation all about shipping containers and community. Hi, I'm Brian Lyons. If the definition of compromise is no one walks away completely happy, then something in D.C. actually feels normal. The federal government is back from its 69-hour dry heave with fresh divisions for the Dems and the GOP kicking the DACA can a little further down the road. Said one progressive critic of the deal, we're back at square one. Senator Schumer gave in too quickly by simply accepting promises by the Senate Majority Leader to do something on immigration. Let's be clear, promises are not going to protect DREAMers from Trump's aggressive deportation machine that is targeting all immigrants. That was last week's guest, activist attorney Cesar Vargas, when we spoke with him this morning. Meanwhile, that compromise did extend CHIP, providing health care for low-income children for another six years. And it may have also jump-started a coalition of moderate senators from both parties willing to work with each other. Still ahead, immigration rights, deportation, and DACA. Police reform in the city, even as the crime rate continues to drop. And art inspired by shipping containers. But first, these things. New York City's efforts to get the lead out of its NYCHA housing has now led the authority's general manager to get out. Michael Kelly will step down a month from now. The third top official pushed out in the wake of a failure to properly conduct lead paint safety inspections, not to mention the year-long effort to cover up the failure. There have also been calls for NYCHA chair and CEO Sholo Latoye to step down, but Mayor de Blasio says he has no plans to replace her. Speaking of the mayor, last month he was proudly promoting a significant drop in the city's jail population. His administration attributes this success to city intervention programs like supervised release, aimed at keeping low-risk people out of jail in the first place. And now the Brooklyn Daily Ego is also reporting that we, Brooklyn that is, should also get some credit since our contribution to the city prison population is down 10 percent since 2016 and a whopping 31 percent since 2013. That's a drop of more than 17,000 inmates to just under 12,000. However, that number may be going up by one. In case you missed it, if you had any doubt that this city has room for all viewpoints, Saturday night, after thousands of women and their supporters finished marching, the alt-right community held a gala in Manhattan. It was called the Night for Freedom, self-described as, quote, a gathering of patriots and political dissidents who are bored with mainstream political events. Not everyone was feeling tolerant, however which guaranteed the event would not be boring. The Daily News says a Brooklyn man punched and choked one of the attendees. He was arrested for possession of a weapon, assaulting a police officer, resisting arrest, and strangulation. Let's keep our cool, Brooklyn. Our first conversation is next. <laughs> We all know how the president of this nation feels about immigration. Well, at least his beloved wall. We're not so sure how he feels about DACA. Meanwhile, using unmarked vans, ICE agents, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, have been targeting immigration rights leaders, causing fear and uncertainty among immigrant communities. To name one prominent example, it's been almost two weeks since one leading activist, Ravi Ragbir, of the New Sanctuary Movement, was arrested and threatened with deportation. He's still in detention upstate in Orange County. But right now, two of Ragbir's supporters are here to talk with us about his case and what lies ahead for immigration policy. 
They're also going to address how a new federal office may alter the relationship between religion and health care and some of the more sensitive issues of our time. Reverend Kaji Dosa from Park Avenue Christian Church. Welcome to 112BK. Thank you so much, Brian. And Reverend Juan Carlos Ruiz of Iglesia de Sion, St. Peter's Church, and co-founder of the New Sanctuary Movement. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Brian. So as we're looking at the headlines and taking into account everything that's happening, I just want to know from you guys, what does it mean to be a sanctuary city at a time when we have a xenophobic administration running the country? Well, we worked really hard, Brian, to become a sanctuary city here in New York City. And I think that it's something that Mayor de Blasio and many of our po politicians are really proud of, which is basically based on a moral and also religious principle that sanctuary means safety. It means being honored and cherished for who you are as a human being first before we ask any other questions. And so when we became a sanctuary city, we decided that we were going to live by the rule of law mm -hmm. and to place, to place due process and all the things that we cherish as American you know, residents of this country first, and then we'd worry about immigration status next. It tends to be that the deportation mechanism asks things in reverse order. And so it says it claims someone is so-called illegal right. and pushes them out of the country before they have a chance to have their day in court, before they have a chance to have any proper legal representation, any proper sense of why they're here in the first place. And so we've said, as a nation, we have always understood immigrants as being part and parcel of our, our understanding of who we are. And all of a sudden, we have policies that haven't caught up to our values. Yeah. So we want to resist that by creating ourselves as a sanctuary city that actually builds in processes to protect people before they get sent mm -hmm. away too early. And we have to say that the political climate right now, uh, I mean, if anything that distinguishes this administration is that of a bullying quality to it. Mm -hmm. So this permeates anything that our government touches. And, and, you know, we are talking about immigration, immigrant communities that are in a vulnerable position, because we haven't had any relief uh, for many, many years. There has been all this enforcement, uh, tilted only policy, uh, punitive and criminalizing to, to our communities, and there hasn't been any kind of humane, reasonable reasonable solution coming from anywhere. So it's talking about coming from anywhere, I remember at that big La Raza convention, there was Obama famously called the deporter in chief. Mm -hmm. So we have Trump in the White House now and Obama as the deporter in chief. What is the difference between those two? Is it just approach? Is the same end result happening, but Trump is just more loud and proud about how he is as a human being? Politicians, probably since the Reagan administration, you could also argue maybe even before that, mm -hmm. have been setting up who we should care about as Americans versus who we shouldn't, as if there were a way to set up policies that regard someone as less than human and less than being worthy of caring about. So, so all of a sudden we start calling people illegal and we start right. calling them alien. And the Bush administration, the Obama administration, to both ballooned ways of being able to set up machinery mm -hmm. to deport people without their due process, without caring about them as human beings. And so this winds up not being a partisan issue because so many people for so many years have been trying to convince Americans that these people are not worth standing up for. And so we're turning that around right now. And that's why I think uh, it's important to have that face. And there are many faces in the immigration movement, but I mean, our executive director, uh, Ravi Rakbir, right. is such a visible face. Yeah. And if they can do that, you know, like there are some people in physical sanctuary and they yeah. basically say, uh, Juan Carlos, if they can do that to Ravi, who is out there, who is very visible, who is very connected. What's going to happen to us? We also know that Jean Montreville was taken uh, yeah. into custody right outside of his home, yeah. like hours before he was going to go in for his regularly scheduled meeting. So is a message being sent, Absolutely. number one, and how is it being received, number two, now that leaders are being taken away? 
Well, we want to be very clear with whoever might watch is that, yes, a message was sent. Gene Montreville had a right to be here. He had a all sorts. I'm not going to try to argue his right. legal case because I'm not a lawyer, but he did not need to be picked up then. He has always shown up for 10 years. And 10 years ago, I went with him to his check-ins. There is no reason they need to think that he would resist yeah. or that he would pose any human physical threat to ICE agents as they tried to take him away, which is the citation they gave us as faith leaders when we went to ask, mm -hmm. why did you pick up Gene? He had two more weeks where he was supposed to be able to walk free. The reason they did it is that they're trying to send a message. And I might say if it were just Gene, that right. it's not just him, but it has been Gene. It it has been Robbie. It's been it's just in Mar our state. Yeah, yeah, it's all over the country. People who've been bold enough to speak up yeah. and speak out. ISIS now starting to target, as if to say, mm -hmm. be afraid. So, Reverend Ruiz, we see what the message is. How's the message being received in the community? Um, there is a lot of terror, as it is. The chilling you know. effects. The, yes. Uh, so, our people are terrorized. Uh, and this has been compounded for, you know, so many years of inaction, uh, be it on the political arena mm -hmm. or anywhere else. I think we do need to step up. Uh, you know, like, I always thought that they were going to harass, first of all, the community centers and uh, labor centers, yeah. you know, they were going after the unions. And we have seen that a little bit, right. but they are coming, uh, after, uh, you know, after our churches, our temples. Yeah. And so there is this active harassment that is in place. And we do need to denounce that. What's our response? I think we need to go on the offensive. I think we need what to does step that look up. Like? Uh, first of all, I think the head of our denominations, of our religious institutions, they really have to declare uh, you know, what, who they stand with. Gotcha. Uh, we have a prophetic tradition that is always speaking on behalf of the voiceless, of the downtrodden. The least of us. Yeah, the least yeah. among us. So we need to really exercise that prophetic role that we all have in our religious denominations. Uh, we need to do that. And at the same time, you know, keep in mind that if they are coming for us in the a.m., they are come, they'll come for you in the afternoon, not even in the evening. Yeah. I mean, this is quick it's coming. because the infrastructure, it's in place. What Trump has evidence is this infrastructure of terror yeah. that has been beefed up in the last 40 years. So, you know? so it's a continuation. It's evidence in a continuation of a policy that has been in place for many, many, many years. What's the difference? Yeah. The explicit rhetoric of uh, racism. Yeah and the connection of the hyper-militarization of our policing and the co-opting of our religious discourse. We, as religious yeah. leaders, I think we need to start claiming uh, amnesty for everybody. Because it's right there in our language. Listen, amnesty and then, for everybody. Yes. I just, in the last 30 seconds that I have, want to talk about your very arrest that happened while you were out standing up for Ravi. Yeah, well, the, the arrest, you know, they came out in full force. Yes. Uh, they used uh, excessive force. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I don't know the politics. I mean, if we want to call this a sanctuary city, I think we need to honor that. You know, we believe when there is such a declaration of a sanctuary city is that NYPD and any city agency do not collaborate with ICE. This is a clear... Uh, kind of shout out loud yeah. that there is such a collaboration. You can see an NYPD officer with his hands choking Reverend Juan Carlos's throat, mm -hmm. uh, who also did that to another officer. We have it on film. And that is a horrible place to leave it, but we are plumb out of time, so I'm going to get a commitment from you guys to come back, please. We'd be glad to. Thank and we you. can yeah. even discuss HHS to not make a liar out of me, so mm -hmm. make some time for us very soon. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No one's disputing that the rates of violent crime in New York City, and especially homicide, are way down compared to a decade or two ago. Murders, there were 290 in 2017, are at their lowest level since the 1940s, when, for one thing, far fewer guns were in circulation. 
Mayor de Blasio and the NYPD are happy to take credit, and part of the success is being attributed to community policing initiatives that were activated throughout the city following Black Lives Matter movement and in response to complaints about the department's stop-and-frisk policies. But just how big a role has community policing played, and how real is the reform? Joining us now is an activist who's kept a close watch on the NYPD for the past decade and who has hardly shied away from being a persistent critic. Robert Ganji, who ran for mayor against de Blasio, is the director of PROP, Police Reform Organizing Project, and he joins us to talk about the work he says still needs to be done around discriminatory and abusive policing in the city. So discriminatory, abusive, and effective by the numbers. Well, we, we don't think that it's, it's clear that New York is a much safer city than it was certainly 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Right. We don't attribute it to policing tactics. We don't attribute it to stop and frisk. We don't attribute it to broken windows, which is the main law enforcement strategy that the NYPD uses now, mm -hmm. essentially targets mainly low-income people of color who engage in low-level infractions that have been virtually decriminalized in white communities. Mm -hmm. Give you, I mean, marijuana possession is a, uh, a good example, where research shows that, that white people use and sell the drug in equal or greater proportion to African-American and Latinos people. Ninety percent of the people in New York City arrested for marijuana possession are people of color. It's clearly a racist policy, and it inflicts um, uh, a kind of trauma on the community of color in the mm -hmm. city, not only through marijuana possession arrests, but a whole host of other kind of arrests, fair beating, petty larceny, suspended license. So we, we recognize that the city is much safer. We attribute it uh, to a, a number of other factors. Right. And it and and should also be said that most criminologists will say, we don't know why crime is dropping so I've significantly. I've seen everything from legalized abortion to kids are eating fewer lead paint chips. Right, right. Can you name one thing besides the mayor and the police chief? <laughs> I think the what, what we would point to, and again, this is speculative, and yeah. also should be said, crime is dropping in virtually every urban center, not only in the United States, but in the world. Mm -hmm. That we attribute it to one is the actual behavior of people in the community. One of the problems with the media, for the most part, mm -hmm. looking to the NYPD as the main cause for a drop in crime, right. it ignores the people who live in the community where crime used to be most prevalent, where it has declined the most significantly. Right. One factor that people refer to is called the little brother syndrome. Mm -hmm. So they're basically talking about young people during the crack epidemic who saw what crack was doing to their parents, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins, and made a decision, we're not going to smoke crack. To make new mistakes. Right. We're not going to follow Right. right I path. may smoke a joint. I may smoke a right. blunt. Not going to deal with crack. So Mayor de Blasio, Police Commissioner O'Neill say we're focusing on smaller communities of people who are responsible for outsized disruption in our communities. Yeah, the, the, Who are they the, talking the, about? Well, the numbers just don't show that. I mean, yeah. we we go into the arraignment parts of the criminal courts on a regular basis, right. and the reason we do that is everybody gets arrested in New York gets arraigned. So mm -hmm. if you go into the arraignment parts. Uh, frequently enough, and you go into the four major boroughs, Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, you'll yeah. have a very good idea of NYPD arrest practices. So, for example, we went to Manhattan two weeks ago, we went to the Bronx last week, we observed 44 cases, every case involving a New Yorker of color, every case, 100 percent. And most of the charges were for low-level infractions, again, marijuana possession, fair beating. Uh, suspended license, yeah. petty larceny, disorderly conduct. Is that broken windows? Broken. That's all broken windows. Yeah. That's targeting I minor that offenses. Was done. No, broken windows is they they significantly reduce the use of stop and frisk. Right. But the basic strategy of policing in New York, not only now but yeah. all throughout the course of history of the city, is to focus on marginalized communities, uh, um, people who are vulnerable politically. So it's it's primarily low-income communities of color. Right. It's also um, street vendors, homeless people, mentally ill people, sex workers. Any community that doesn't have a lot of political muscle to push back against abusive and discriminatory practices gets targeted by the NYPD. And I know that sounds very, very negative. Right. And so sometimes I hear myself saying it, and, um, and I say to myself, that's harsh. 
but it is true. But if de Blasio ran this tale of two cities and he said, I'm going to be tough on crime, and now he has his bona fides, the right. numbers are there. So how do we By the way, all policing? the—I mean, Giuliani ran on right? those bona fides. Yeah. Bloomberg ran on those bona fides. Uh, crime is definitely dropping in New York City. It's not primarily because of policing tactics. And neighborhood policing is the—or the, community policing, yeah. which— uh, de Blasio touts, that's an insignificant program. It's a very small percentage of, mm -hmm. of officers who are involved in neighborhood policing. It's to say that that's the primary reason why crime is dropping in the city yeah. is this service really to the public understanding of what the incident, what it, what's involved with the incidence of crime. Another factor, we think, is, the, is open enrollment in the city university system. Mm. The, anyone who gets, comes out of high school in New York City can go to a college. Right. Many of the students in New York City go to the community colleges first and then graduate from there and go on to the four-year colleges. That, we think, has had a significant effect on on uh, producing more stability mm -hmm. and in investing more young people it's in a, a straight life and a life of going. Uh, so in our last 10 seconds, I'm going to invite you to give credit where credit is due. You just talked about the availability of education. What's an unsung hero of these numbers that the New York Times hasn't rang up yet? There are more programs that, and I'll acknowledge this, that the Blasio has supported uh, that deal directly with violence in the community. There's one particular program that had, there's some research that's been done on it. It's very highly thought of. It's called Cure Violence Programs. They're in different communities in the city, in about 12 communities. They involve staff people, some of whom have already had problems with mm -hmm. the criminal justice system, so they have credibility in the community with young people who might be considering a criminal lifestyle. And they work directly with young people. They work directly with people who are getting into gang disputes to sort of resolve those disputes right. without violence. And we think those kind of programs are the more effective approach for dealing with um, the crime problem than any kind of policing tactic. That and more education and jobs and gotcha. better schools, of course. All right, Robert Gangia Prop, we appreciate it. Thank you. If art is a reflection of society, it also draws from our communities and changes them in turn. Brooklyn artist Leslie Kirby has internalized this process, and to see how it externalized in her work, you can come to Brick House and see it animated and projected on our giant garage doors right behind us. Recently, she and Ashley spoke about her exhibition, The World Contained Two. Here they are. Leslie, thank you so much for being here. Can I ask you really quickly how you decided to embark on this project? What motivated you? Uh, throughout my art practice, I'm really interested in communities and um, how we interact with one another in communities. And I like to look at um, various ideas at kind of moments of change. So the uh, video animation that I uh, worked with uh, two collaborators on is part of a larger body of work on shipping containers and looking at containers in, uh, in our global economy. Um, as I started researching this idea, um, I, my initial exploration was works on paper. I, did, mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of printmaking, and so I was making prints and collaging the prints and kind of starting to articulate this idea. Um, after that, I had an opportunity to make a three-dimensional sculpture out mm -hmm. of cardboard that I also printed. And the cardboard sculpture, the pieces from that, became the basis of the imagery in the video animation. Oh, wow. I had been doing a lot of reading and sort of noticing that containers were popping up everywhere. And everywhere. Being, and being reused in so many different ways. Turned from into homes in some cases. Exactly. Yes. It seems like a number of years ago you mostly heard about people, um, you know, trying to leave uh, violent situations mm -hmm. and, and kind of finding their way into a container and then unfortunately not making it to right. whatever their destination was. And so I just, it just seemed like there was kind of this this moment of change, and then obviously our whole method of shipping goods around the world now has uh, been changed and Absolutely. been impacted. 
Um, and even I've been a resident of um, Borham Hill since 1982. So a long time Brooklynite. A long time Brooklynite. And then, you know, no noticing the changes along our waterfront. We mm -hmm. have the beautiful Brooklyn Bridge Park now, but that was a pretty active uh, shipping port for a long time. And I think containerization has kind of changed the way um, that all, that kind of business all took place. So for the people who are listening in, maybe via podcast right now, mm -hmm. what are they gonna see when they come to check out your work? Well, it's a lot of moving shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I built the sculpture, I uh, went to a laser cutter and I pre-cut all different rectangular shapes of cardboard mm -hmm. um, and printed onto those, collaged them, made them dimensional, um, and in the process of creating the animation, I photographed the pieces from the sculpture. So it's a lot of independent pieces that then Leanne and I brought together in this kind of story format for wow. the piece, for the animation. So we were um, looking at kind of the function of containers being stacked really high in the right. shipyard and then eventually being loaded on those gigantic container ships right? Um, and moving across the water. So you kind of see that action. It changes plane in the animation. And then ultimately building a gigantic community. And the very end, you see sort of greenery coming in, referencing other uses for containers now, which are like hydroponic farms that are mobile yeah. and can go to remote locations. So I'm packing a lot and I'm asking a lot of the viewer to kind of <laughs> take this journey with me as I'm moving all of these shapes around on the screen. Right. Um, what was really terrific here at Brick was that um, they have three projectors. So um, the animation is kind of repeated three times to, to fill the entire garage door. Wow. Which also adds to this whole concept and the feeling and look of the yards where you know, you look down for miles and miles through the There's like containers. a continuity. Yeah, that. that was really interesting. And also what's been terrific um, because of the way Brick has put together their new building with the big stoop, mm -hmm. um, on a couple of the weekend days I came and hung out and just struck up conversations with people who would come in. I like what I'm doing to evoke other conversations. And you got and all thoughts. that right here. Exactly. That's wonderful. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming and for having this conversation with us. I'm really excited for people to come see the exhibition. Can you tell them one more time what it's called and when they can come see it? Okay, it's, uh, the title of the piece is The World Contained Two, mm -hmm. and it will be um, on view uh, today, which is the 22nd until 6 o'clock and the following Monday, January 29th, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Well, thank you so much. Again, I appreciate having you. I hope we have you back sometime, and I hope more and more people come and check out the exhibition. Maybe you'll even, they'll even end up inadvertently talking to you about them. You never know. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Ashley's back tomorrow when she'll sit down with State Senator Jesse Hamilton a member of the controversial Independent Democratic Coalition who often votes with the Republicans. Plus, we'll hear about a lawsuit involving Twitter and Trump, and spoken word artist Mahogany Brown will offer up a whole bunch of spoken words. Bye now.